All right. According to the clock on my tablet, it's time to get started. We're going to talk about rings. But we're Adventists. And comets. Oh, okay. Yes, we are Adventists. And, I don't know. I How are rings related to Adventists? Oh, there because time. when I was a child, wedding bands were one of the forbidden things. And then they decided that so many people were doing it that maybe they should reconsider it. And after all, the whole principle was about spending money on things, not about the actual adornment. And so they decided wedding bands are okay, but all other rings are of the devil. And that's the official stance of the church today. Of the devil. <laughs> they go right with earrings. <laughs> I think I'm supposed to kick people out of class when they come to class with earrings, but I've never done that. Yeah. Okay. So let us talk about astronomy things and not about Eliezer's favorite earrings. Okay, so. Ring systems. The first ring system was discovered by Galileo in 1610. Now, when Galileo discovered these in 1610, he was really confused. At first, what he saw with his obviously kind of crummy telescope was something that looked like that. So he thought that maybe there were handles on um, on Saturn. Didn't make any sense to him at all. But of course, we know that the planets have tilts, and as Saturn went on and he observed it, it got to where the ring was facing straight toward the Earth, in which situation he couldn't see it anymore. It was too small for his telescope to see it. And so it disappeared. But then, of course, it keeps going and reappears, and he was just baffled. In 1659, Christian Huygens, I think it was 1659, observed the rings were detached from Saturn, that they weren't actually part of Saturn. That is, he could see that there was this dark band between the planet and the ring. And then, in 1857, <laughs> nearly 200 years later, James Clerk Maxwell, Clerk was the family name originally, Maxwell was an added family name, so that's why it's Clerk Maxwell, not just Maxwell. He did some simple physics calculations and said, there is no material possible that could make this a solid disk. It would break apart. And so he said it has to be made of small things. Now that's a pretty big range of times for the understanding to develop. And further research has been done, so we know that we have gaps. This gap here is called the Cassini's division. You can see that dark gap, the most obvious one. These were named with the outermost layer, the A ring. And then there's, and honestly, I can't be sure. I think this is the B ring, and this in here is the C ring. I could be wrong on the, the B versus C parts. And then they found that there are more and more yeah, the separation between A and B is Cassini, so I'm right. <laughs> um, they found there are more and more striations and variations, so that now there's, you know, those A, B, C, and then you have D, E, F that don't follow that simple sequential order. So, what are these rings like? Well, they obviously look bright. A lot of examination has been done to try to figure out what they are. And the verdict is these are primarily made of ice. That's what it is primarily. There is some regions that are dark, um, maybe have some carbon stuff coating them. There are some that are probably rocky, but the majority is ice. So generally we say that the rings of Saturn are ice rings. Um, 
these rings are made up of tiny pieces. Now this here is a false color image that was made by examining the absorption spectra of the different, you know, different regions. So when you see the absorption spectra, what does that tell you? Okay, different types of atoms. It tells you about the chemical composition. So the chemical composition does vary. It's not the same chemical composition throughout. The larger gaps have names like Cassini's division. There's an Anke division. Um, there's a Kirkwood gap. And those divisions, well, something that obviously comes to mind is what causes them. And, okay, come on. I'm actually not going to ask you this right now. I want to go to finish that idea. I actually went back two slides because I have the high resolution picture here of the rings. And in these rings, you see like this gap right here. This is the Cassini division. Change to color that's going to show up. I'm going to write there. In this high resolution picture, you can see that there's some stuff in that Cassini division, right? Yeah. It's not empty, but there's a lot less stuff. What creates it is one of two things. It can either be an orbital resonance with a moon, and that's what's going on with this Cassini division. The moon Mimas orbits out here. I think that's right, Mimas. And it has a three to two, or no, a one to two resonance with things that orbit in that Cassini division. What that means is it's kind of like when I talked about pushing somebody in a swing. I talked about that, didn't I, for resonance? And so it's like every other time the stuff in the middle goes around, it matches up with Mimas. And so Mimas is going to have a direct gravitational pull. So it's like being in a swing. And every other time you swing back, you get pulled further back. Well, just reverse it because that's what we do in swings. We don't pull back, we push, right? So just reverse it. Say every other time you get a push. What's going to happen to your amplitude, how big you swing, if you get pushed every other time you come back? You're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's what happens to things that are orbiting in that Cassini division. Every other time they come around, they get tugged a little bit, so the orbit just gets a little more elliptical. And each time it gets a little more elliptical until the orbit gets big enough that it collides with something else, and then it finds a new orbit. And so that's how that Cassini division is made. That gap is made by things being perturbed by that one to two resonance with Mimas. Okay, now let's go to the first clicker question. What is the primary material of Saturn's rings? There isn't anything to troll you on with this one. There's what? There isn't anything to troll you on with this one. Rock and roll. Rock and roll, that would be great. <laughs> Troll? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Why do we see much of Saturn's rings yet? Jupiter, we hardly see them. We'll talk about that. We will talk about that, just not at this juncture. Later in today's lecture. Whoops. I wish it was 12. 10, 1, and 2. Okay, so 10 people said ice, because that's what I wrote on the slide when I said that ice is the primary compound. One person said rock and two said carbon compounds. Those are also things that are found, but they are much smaller in, um, in percentage composition than the ice. Okay, all of the gas giants have ring systems. So when was it that the ring system for Saturn was discovered? 1610. When was the ring system for Jupiter discovered? Long after. Very good. I believe it's 1979. 
The big difference in time means that telescopes were improved vastly in the intervening period. And it wasn't found until 1979 when a spacecraft was able to take a picture of Jupiter from the backside and see the rings. The rings are virtually impossible to see from the front side. Why? Two reasons. Number one, the rings are very, very thin. Number two is that the rings are made out of dark particles. They're basically rocky things. And so those rocky things don't reflect light. Dark rock doesn't reflect light well. So it doesn't reflect light well. You just can't see them from Earth. So it took a long time to discover those. And here you can see Neptune's ring system and Uranus's ring system. They all have ring systems, but they're different. The ring system of Saturn is nothing like those three ring systems. Now, Uranus has some material that's um, more carbonaceous, not rock. Um, Neptune and Jupiter are mostly rock. So when we look at these rings, we say, okay, so all of the large planets have rings, but they're very different. And only one of them has a big, significant ring system. So then we ask, where do they come from? So let me, let me ask my front table, Alina, a guess, a scientific hypothesis. We see we have a ring system. We have a hypothesis. I think it came from this because of this. Where do you think they might have come from? Right? This is not based on you knowing the answer. It's thinking of ideas. Maybe God created it. That's an option, right? I believe in a God that creates, so that works. Do you have another right now? To be clear, that's not a scientific hypothesis. Doesn't mean it's a wrong hypothesis, though. Right? We need to separate those two in our minds. Do you have another idea? Because the large mass of the planets, the comets and small objects that caught in a gravitational pull, but not so much that pulled it all the way into the center. Okay. Now that's very close to what the, the traditional scientific hypothesis is. Wow. The, the traditional scientific hypothesis <laughs> is that random objects, they could have been comets. What kind of material are comets made out of? Ice. Ice. Ices. They have some rock, but most, you know, a lot of ice. So it could be a comet that came in got close enough, there is a word, I think on the next slide, called the Roche limit. Nope, not on this one. Okay, I'm going to stay here and just talk about it with these pictures, because I like having the pictures up there. The Roche limit, it actually varies depending on the density of the planet, but it is approximately... 2.44 times the radius of the planet. That distance, which can be, of course, mathematically calculated, is the distance where if something gets that close and it's made of just dirt that's clumped together, the difference in the gravitational pull will, from one side to the other will shred it, tear it apart. So anything that's just held together by gravity, if it comes inside of that Roche limit, the tidal forces, the difference in the gravitational forces you go near and farther, will shred it. So you could have had a comet that came inside the Roche limit, and the gravitational forces, the tidal forces, shredded it, broke it up into pieces. And then that could have established material that was orbiting around. So that is the primary idea. Now, we have some asteroids that are rocky, that are, you know, been molten rock and fused together. Those would be able to withstand being inside the Roche limit. But ones that are just compressed soil, if you will, they would come apart. Yeah? How does this explain why most of or most of that most of the planets have only big, and Okay, a second piece here. We have material that's orbiting around. We have a very special thing going on with our moon. 
Our moon is actually gaining energy from the earth and moving farther away from us. But if we didn't have this liquid ocean, you would have what's called a tidal drag. And what happens is the material that's orbiting slowly loses energy and falls in. And so, now our textbook does say recent calculations suggest that maybe a ring system could last a lot longer than we thought, so it could be possible that a ring system would last for billions of years. But traditional calculations suggest that ring systems shouldn't last more than a few tens of thousands of years. So you have something that falls close enough inside the Roche limit and gets shredded, and it forms a ring system, but then the stuff in the ring system is, keeps falling inward slowly until it hits the planet and disappears. So ring systems are temporary. They're not permanent. So Saturn will not permanently have those rings. That's, that's the prevailing scientific opinion. So the fact that Saturn has those rings means that something in the recent past, last few tens of thousands of years, had to have come in and it would have had to have been a large cometary object and been shredded to create the rings of Saturn. These other objects, they have just these very ephemeral rings, could be remnants of something that happened a long time ago, or we have some other things going on. Things like a moon that has geysers that kicks material out. Well, that stuff will form a very thin ring. If it escapes from the moon, it will form a thin ring. Likewise, if you have collisions with a moon, you could have stuff knocked off in those collisions. And of course, if it goes farther out, it's going to be a longer period. It goes inside, it's a shorter period. They set, tend to spread out and form rings. So you could also have rings that are formed from objects that are moons that have had something that, to make them eject material. Did you have a question? I, I thought I saw your hand. Okay, back there. Yeah, I, I, now none of the inner planets have rings, but the theory on how the moon formed is that something collided with Earth, threw all that stuff out there, and you would have had a ring that started clumping. And so the theory on how the moon formed presupposes that the Earth had a ring for a while. Okay. Now, I talked about the resonance that creates the Cassini division. Another thing that gives structure to the rings is what we call shepherd moons. So in this picture over here on the left, um, that's from Uranus. That's why the, there's U7 and U8 for those two little moons. You have a moon on the inside and a moon on the outside. And these moons give tugs to material and this band in the middle, stuff gets pushed into that band because of the two shepherd moons, as they're called. They're called shepherd moons because they kind of guide the stuff into that band. And those shepherd moons will create interesting patterns, such as the other pattern you see. What, what do you see when you look at the lower left picture? Okay, lower left if you're like this. <laughs> lower right like this. Okay. Okay, you have what they call a braided ring. That's really cool. It really is. And that results from the action of those two satellites shepherding, shepherding the material and forming that. So the rings, their structure is either from the resonance with a moon or shepherd moons. Here's where I had the word Roche limit talked about. And we have seen this action occur. I, well, at least in my lifetime, since I've been teaching physics, um, there was the comet Shoemaker-Levy, or some people say Schumacher-Levy, whatever. Um, the comet that got too close to Jupiter. And Jupiter's tidal forces shredded the comet. 
and then pieces fell into Jupiter, causing large impacts, which we'll actually see a picture of an impact on Jupiter in one of the coming up slides. So we do know that things really do get shredded when they get closer than the Roche limit. This is to Jupiter or for any? Well, that was the observation I'm talking about was for Jupiter, but it would occur for any planet. Remember, I wrote down the Roche limit is about 2.44 times the radius of the planet, but that number actually depends on the density of the planet. Okay, next clicker question. Which planet or planets has or have rings around it or them? I want to make sure my wording did not give away an answer. Okay, everybody's answered. We have a, an even split almost between the Jovian ones and the gas giants. Now let's clarify. What are the Jovian planets? That's also true. What are the gas giants? And in case people were worried, yes, that's not the right order in, you know, it's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, but that, that's not what we were shooting for. Okay, so we had a split between the gas giants or the Jovians. It's supposed to be the Jovians. What was that? Then it's supposed to be the Jovians because Uranus and Neptune. You're correct. Uranus and Neptune have rings. All of the Jovian planets have rings. I did the gas giants here because our textbook talked about the gas giants and the ice giants. Hence my use of the internet meme, where are the ice giants? What? When I learned that the gas giants included all of them. Okay. And so, so that could be why there's a difference of, of answers here. And what's important here is that you understand the answer. <laughs> Not that you chose the one that is the one I chose to be correct in this case. Okay, moving. F yeah, we got time. I'm on schedule. Trans Neptunian worlds. We have Pluto. Pluto used to be considered a planet, lost its planethood status, really because it didn't fit in, but they made rules so that there would be a clear separation of segregation so that we could say this is a planet, this is not. And that was in many ways driven by the fact that additional objects had been found that were large and like Pluto. So two categories to talk about here. Plutinos. I actually checked on these words so I'd have them right now. Plutinos are objects that have the same 3-2 resonance with Neptune that Pluto has. So that means they're going to have the same semi-major axis of roughly 39.5 or something astronomical units. They don't have to have the same eccentricity. They could be circular orbits or they could be you know, eccentric like Pluto's, but they need to have that resonance. And there are a lot of objects that have that resonance. A lot of objects that are, because of gravitational forces, have been pulled into orbits that have a 3 to 2 resonance with Neptune's orbit. Now, one thing that's interesting about Pluto is that Pluto's orbit sometimes crosses inside of Neptune. But because they're in a 3 2 resonance, it's very predictable when it's going to be inside of Neptune's orbit, and the two will never meet. There will never be a collision between Neptune and Pluto because they've, they're locked in on that resonance. Now, another object that has that resonance is Orcus. Now, I will once again turn to my master of mythology. Tell me about Pluto and Orcus. Okay. Orcus is also named after it. It's just a different um, language. And in fact, the, the two mean exactly the same god. 
So Orcus and Pluto are really named after the same god. Why? Because Orcus is considered the anti-Pluto. Now Orcus is much smaller, as you'll see in the next um, table. But Orcus is a Plutino, like Pluto, has the same 3 2 resonance. Orcus, whenever Pluto is at its perihelion, Orcus is at its aphelion. When Pluto is at its aphelion, Orcus is at perihelion. And so the, the two are essentially orbiting opposite each other. That's why they chose the name Orcus, because it was the anti-Pluto, and they decided using another name for Pluto would be the best for anti. So that's an interesting thing to look at. Anything that has an orbit beyond the orbit of Neptune is a trans-Neptunian object. And so there are over 100 objects that have been discovered at this point that are trans-Neptunian objects, things that orbit beyond the orbit of Pluto. And notice, more than 130 have been discovered of these. <laughs> I, I've got different numbers. At least one of them is more massive than Pluto. What's the name of the one that's more massive than Pluto? That's the one we know of, Eris. No, Pluto, or Orcus is much less. But Eris is more massive than Pluto. So Pluto is not super special. Yeah. Eris is named after the Greek goddess of chaos. And discord. And what, do you remember what Brown wanted to name it? No, no. No, no, no. It was another thing, but he, he, he wanted to name it after a TV show. He I wanted know. to name it Xena from oh, Xena the Warrior Princess. But, but they chose the outfit they know because it had to be a goddess. That, that. Yes. So that's why it's not Xena. So I, I, you know, for a few years in class, I called it Xena because that was its, its preliminary name before it was rejected. <laughs> okay, so here's a list of some of the large trans Neptunian worlds with some interesting pieces of data about each one. So we have the diameter, so you can see the sizes. Now I went through and tried to update these this week, so hopefully I have the right numbers. And you can see the largest here in diameter is Pluto. Now when I first made this table two or three years ago, Eris was there as the biggest one. But because of New Horizons, we have learned more about Pluto and have found that it's actually a little bit bigger than Eris. I didn't worry about flipping them on the picture, on the graphic. These are generally in order of size. You can look at the mass, and you see Eris is significantly more massive than Pluto. Right, that's 4 out of 13. That's a significant fraction. So Eris is quite a bit more massive, but smaller in size. If it's more massive, it's smaller in size. What does that tell you about its composition? More dense. More dense, hence probably more rock, less ice. Semi-major axis for Eris is very large. 67.8 astronomical units. Some people said, well, now the New Horizons has explored Pluto. Let's go find Eris. Well, depending on where it is in its orbit, Eris actually, at its perihelion, is closer to Earth than Pluto is at its aphelion. Eris also has a pretty eccentric orbit. You can see 0.44 for its eccentricity. Question? How many Earth years does it take for Eris to go around this one orbit? I don't remember offhand. It's a large number, but we, we, we could calculate that though, right? Because we have the equation period squared is equal to the semi-major axis cubed. So that means the period is the semi major axis to the 3 halves power. So you just take in your calculator, and I know you can't see my calculator here, 67.8 astronomical units raised to the 1.5 power, because 3 over 2 is 1.5. And it's 558. I'm glad that you have faith. About 558 years. For an orbit. So yeah, long time. Okay, coming down to Makemake, you can see the tilde means we 
are guessing. It's approximate. So approximately 1,500 kilometers, a mass of maybe 2 to 5 times 10 to the 21 kilograms. Right? We don't know what its mass is, but that's the suspected mass. And you can see its semi-major axis, 45.7 astronomical units, farther away than Pluto. 0.16 for its eccentricity. That's closer to circular. Sedna. <laughs> Sedna is 524.4 astronomical units away. If we do that same calculation, we're going to get 524.4. Whoops. I know you can't see this again. That gives us 12,008 years. Let's just round, it's, well, rounding 12,009 years. Earth years? Yeah, 12,009 Earth years for Sedna to do one orbit around the sun. I'm not waiting up for it, right? Clearly, I'm not waiting for Eris or even for Pluto to do a complete orbit. So that one's way out there. The mass, we have no clue what its mass is. How would we find out? How do we know the mass of any of these objects? Science. Wasn't that kind of based on the like, objects orbiting them? That's right. Based on objects orbiting them. We don't know of any objects orbiting Sedna. It's way too far away for us to see it interacting with anything, so we just have no idea. And so that's why it's just a question mark. Are we waiting for it to get close to us? I'm not. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's way, way, way out there. I was just looking up, my office worker asked, how, how far away is Voyager now? Voyager 1 is 133 astronomical units away. That's the most distant of any spacecraft we've sent out. And that's an impressive distance, 133 times the Sun-Earth distance away. But that's nowhere close to Sedna. And it's been in or it's been out there for thirty-eight years. So Question. Does it have a very elliptical orbit? So highly, highly elliptical, 0.85. So then at one point isn't it going to be closer to the main point? Yes, yes. At one point in its orbit it will be really close. And I, I don't know if it's close to perihelion now or not. Okay. But remember, they travel a lot faster when they're close. And so it's time that's going to be close to small compared to the time it's going to be far. Okay, coming down, Haumea, Karin. See, Karin is a reasonable facsimile of Pluto. You know, it's about half the size of Pluto. Its mass is, uh, well, we learned 12%, the mass of Pluto. And, of course, it has the same semi-major axis because it's orbiting with Pluto. It's a satellite of Pluto. Qualwar, Qualwar is, I would say, similar to Make Make in its semi-major axis. And look at that. What would you tell me about Qualwar's orbit? It's pretty close to circular. And then finally, Orcus. Orcus, we talked about the anti-Pluto. That's very similar to the semi-major axis there for Karin. It's not exactly the same, but it's another Plutino. So now I'm going to go back just so we can look at the picture now of these things in their orbits to put them in our heads once again. So here's Sedna's orbit, which you may or may not have noticed fades away to dark here because it's got such a big orbit. And I believe, actually, Sedna probably is where they show it, which would be close to its perihelion. Eris, Orcus, Pluto, Qualwar, yeah. Okay. Rings. Com yeah, yeah, it's time to get to comments. I'm just trying to think of what's on the next slide. <laughs> Obviously, it was going to come up and tell me. So, comments. Comets are visible in the sky, usually big. Like when you go out to view a comet, 
You traditionally don't use a telescope to view a comet. You use something like binoculars or your naked eye. Because comets have huge tails. Now, the question of the comet and its how it's made was answered already by Holly. Right? Wasn't it you that spoke of them? No. Yes. No? Was it Megan? Megan. Okay, Megan. Right. It was one of them. Okay, so with the comets, the comet is created by essentially an ice ball. And so you have here the nucleus of the comet. That's the actual object. And for the vast majority of the comet's lifetime, <laughs> we wouldn't consider it a comet. Because it's going to be out like in the Kuiper belt or in the Oort cloud. And it's just going to be orbiting along as things do. But when this icy object, the nucleus, gets closer to the sun, it starts having the sun heated up and causing sublimation, which I thought the word was somewhere on here. It must be on the next one. It's just where it goes from solid straight into gas. Where it goes from solid into gas. And so that core starts giving off gas. And of course, you know, you've seen things like that before. Gas is going off in all directions and creates the coma or the head of the comet. The word comet is based on its shape because it looks like a comma. Truth. That's where the name comes from. So you have all of that gas that was driven away from the nucleus because it was close enough to the sun that the sun was banking it. Well, then you have, since it's close enough for the sun, for the sun to bake it, you have what we call the solar wind. Did anyone see the, uh, I didn't see anything last night at lab, but anybody see the northern lights are supposed to be visible? What? And this morning there was nothing because it was overcast. Was on Monday. Um, those are caused by charged particles streaming away from the sun and hitting the earth. And when we have a massive blast of those, and that's what we're going to start talking about, um, you'll start with your exploration on Friday of the sun. When we have a large blast, we see auroras on earth. But there's always charged particles streaming away from the sun. And so those charged particles are going to interact with the charged particles that are in the gas that was ejected from the comet and blow them away from the sun, directly away from the sun. So charged particles, what we call the ions in the tail of the comet, always point away from the sun. Now what about non-charged particles, things like dusty things? Well, those are still going to have collisions with solar wind particles streaming away from the sun. They will also absorb energy from the sunlight that gives them a little momentum. So the dust tail tends to also point away from the sun, but not perfectly away from the sun. It will also trail just a little behind the comet. You have questions, Satish? Yeah, I was just wondering when, like, how do objects in the Kuiper Belt approach the sun ever? Okay, how do they approach the sun? This is a good question. The textbook answers for the Oort cloud, not so much for the Kuiper Belt. So, um... I'm trying to think if I have, well, I don't know if I have a good graphic for it, so I'll just go with this. Um, well, I do have a graphic that shows the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt, so I'll wait until I get to that graphic, and then I'll answer your question. So how do we know anything about comets? Well, we know things about the composition of the comets by, number one, looking at absorption and emission spectra. One of the things that's been observed in the, the tail of comets is that there is um, cyanide gas in the tail of, I forgot which comet it was. So back, okay now, it it, I was looking this up before class, Halley's Comet rhymes with valid. A very small number of people who have that name pronounce the name Holly, as in, you know, like a hall. Like Holly? Somebody did a survey. Yes. It pronounced the same, yes, but yeah. There was a survey done of people who currently carry the name. It was two that 
pronounced it Haley, two that pronounced it um, Holly, and all the rest pronounced it Howie. And astronomers call Howie's Comet Howie's Comet. So, anyway, with that, when I was in college was the last time Howie's Comet came around. The time before that, which was in the 19 aughts, they knew that there was cyanide in the tail, and Halley's Comet came close enough to Earth that the tail of the comet actually hit the Earth. And so people were, oh no, cyanide, yes, we're all going to die. <laughs> and one of the greatest scams I have ever heard of was developed. People who sold pills that would counteract the cyanide so that you wouldn't die. America. That is genius because what if it doesn't work? That is, what if the people die? They can't, they can't sue you. <laughs> and what if they skin. don't die? They it, it, it works. It works. <laughs> it's genius. Yeah, well, then you say, hey, but look, you were, you were safe just in case. You can't lose with that scam. But it does make it honest. Um, so one thing that would give us knowledge about the comets is looking at the spectra. In recent years, we have had spacecraft that have gone and visited comets and actually interacted, measured, um, collected gases and that things, that kind of thing to give us more information and actually taken pictures here you see Halley's Comet while it is giving off gas. It's pretty cool to have a spacecraft out there that could take that picture. And here you see the comet Wild 2. I want to say Wild 2. Doesn't it make more sense to say Wild 2 if we're going to say, you know, instead of wild like an American would? Because we all know. We, we may not all know. A class I barely passed in college, I learned to pronounce Spy. You know, I learned all that. Um, I'm proud. So we do have some knowledge of what they look like in the composition. One of the interesting things that's been found about the comets is they are not all the same. There are variations. We can't just say, ah, we found one comet, we know the composition of that comet, they're all the same. I am not going to get through today's lab, or lecture. <laughs> So um, this here I can go past because I've talked about everything in this slide. Here you see the two tails. The ion tail is also sometimes called the type 1 tail. I for ion is the way I remember it. The dust tail is called the type 2 tail. And so the ion tail, the type 1 tail, is always directly away from the sun. Okay, my line isn't perfect, but you get the idea. The dust tail is also trailing, so I can look at this and say, well, the comet must be going something like that. That would be my guess for the comet's path. Notice instead of the tail of two cities, it was the two tails of the comet. Here's a graphic illustrating how the tails are going to vary from when the comet is too far away to have a tail to when it comes closest to the sun. And if you look in that graphic, you see at the top, left and right, there is no tail. Because it's just an icy object. But then as it gets closer, the sun is baking stuff off. It starts to form its head, and then you have stuff blown away. And the blue stuff, the ion tail, is always directly away from the sun. Whereas the dust tail here does some trailing behind. It's still being pushed by radiation pressure and whatnot, but it's not as strong a push as the solar wind on charged particles. Okay, I do believe it's a clicker question. Nope, not yet. Okay, this is where I'm going to answer Seth's question. This is the picture that shows where we believe the things that make up comets are. Two pieces, the Kuiper belt, which is this blue circle in here, and then the Oort cloud that's out here. The Oort cloud is so far out there that other stars can give enough of a pull on stuff there to change their orbits. So, right, the, one of the things that I found interesting as I was preparing for the lecture 
is that the distance from the sun to the outer limit of the Oort cloud is about half the distance between the sun and our next nearest neighbor, Proxima Centauri. So the pull of the sun on that is not that much stronger than the pull of Proxima Centauri on objects that are in the outer part of the Oort cloud. So that's why other stars can affect and make them change orbits from time to time. Also, just within the Oort cloud, the Kuiper belt, then, if I have Oort cloud object A that gets deviated into a more elliptical orbit, it comes in, it hits something, and causes it to have chain reaction so that you can have multiple things going all the way down that have their orbits deviated because of the initial deviation from the outside. So, um, oh, and things like, you know, you have Sedna with its really crazy 500 and some astronomical unit orbit. When it comes close, you know, each time it's going to find something different and jostle it. So those are the kinds of things that would create new comets. Once again, comets, every time it comes by the sun, the sun is causing material to sublime, which means you have less ice left. So comets only have a finite lifetime. They can only make a few passes around the sun before they're going to lose too much material and fail. So comets can't last forever. If the scientific theory is correct, no comet that we see today you know, existed early in the solar system. It was just an or cloud or Kuiper belt object out there and became a comet sometime fairly recently, like let's say within the last million years, easy. So comets can't be permanent. We like to think that Halley's Comet is going to come around every 77 years. Every 76. Well, it, it's, I see it printed both ways, and you have to get the number of days if you want to actually be correct. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm not, certainly not going to argue about it. But Halley's Comet will come back at that frequency until it breaks apart. I don't know if you recall, but last year we were supposed to have the most awesome comet ever. Did you guys read about that? Isn't it a fluke? Well, I mean, all comets are flukes, right? Right there. This was the first pass for this comet, and the calculations of the trajectory said that it was going to come by the sun, and if it made it past the sun, it was going to be a super bright comet in the sky in December. Now, of course, we've all read the Bible, and we know about the story of you know, Christ's birth and the, the light in the sky that the, um, the wise men followed and whatnot. And there's a lot of conjecture. What were they following? And, of course, the Bible says, you know, we have an angel choir. At least that's what the shepherds saw. We assume that's the same thing that the wise men saw. But people who don't believe in a God are looking for another explanation. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost a little bit funny. You're going to take the book that you don't believe and try to make an explanation that makes it so it doesn't have the person the book you don't believe in is about. But um, some of the options are that it could have been a comet. Comets tend to be in the sky for you know, a month or so. And comets have the motion because they're orbiting through the sky, so we see them in different places at different times. So a comet would seem to be a good guiding thing because it's moving. It tells you where to go. Um, other options would have been something like a nova or a supernova. We'll learn more both about those coming soon, but we talked about Tycho's supernova. Well, he called it a nova because they didn't know about supernova yet. Um, but those are some of the options that are used to try to explain the biblical story and not involve an angel choir. Angel choir, of course, is what the Bible says. Oh, yeah, so going on with that story then, it pretty much didn't survive the sun. It was its first pass, got too close to the sun, got torn up. No great December comet to get everybody thinking about the birth of Christ. And of course... As Christians, we tend to not believe that Christ was born in December anyway. We believe that's a pagan holiday for the winter solstice. But, okay, you can answer starting now. 
Um, it's the time when people think of the birth of Christ. In what direction does the eye and tail of a comet point? I do know you didn't. That's correct. <laughs> okay, so we had four people that said directly behind the comet. Oh. Yes, those would, those would be wrong. Away from the sun. It's away from the sun. It's the, the charged solar wind from the sun that pulls all the ion materials away from the sun with it. Okay, it's the end of the lecture period, so have a sweet Wednesday.